Okay, we're rolling. This is so strange. I'm sitting at home in my dining room talking to a computer screen and I'm teaching this year's edition of Beyond Networks, um, the Beyond Networks lecture. Um, this is my first recording, uh, my first recorded lecture ever, so I'm going to try really hard to act casual as if I was in a classroom and uh, you'll see that it probably feels a little awkward. This is weird for me, this is weird for you, so bear with me, um, I'll hopefully get better at this um, over the semester. My name is Yogi Yeager um, and I'll be your lecturer. Um, and I wanna start this lecture before I tell you what it's all about in this first module um, by introducing myself. And here's a little map of the earth. I started out in Switzerland uh, where I studied, I'm from the Swiss mountains, um, I, where I studied in Zurich and Basel, I studied biology um, and uh, was trained as a Drosophila geneticist originally. But I was rather frustrated with the sort of explanations that were going around in the lab I was working in. So I looked for a completely different experience. And on my search, um, I found this place called Schumacher College in the southwest of England in Dartington in Devon, where a biologist named Brian Goodwin was teaching at the time. So I did a, my master's um, with him uh, in holistic science. And this has nothing to do with hand healing, but it has something to do with um, systems biology before it was really called systems biology. I'll tell you more about that as the course goes on. This was a, a really a head turner for me, coming from a traditional genetics lab, um, to see how you could see the world with a completely different perspective. And this is gonna be a common theme throughout this lecture, that you can see the world um, from different perspectives and they don't compete, they complement each other or they just coexist in the worst uh, case. So after this sort of career defining year, uh, uh, in this wonderful uh, place in England. I went to the United States, uh, to the East Coast, just outside New York, uh, where I did a PhD at the University of Stony Brook, and I learned to mathematically model um, gene networks. Uh, and the models I was making were based on quantitative data that we were gathering in the lab there. So I worked in the lab and taught myself mathematical modeling um, at that time. Um, after five years there, I moved on to the Museum of Zoology, housed in this absolutely wonderful brutalist building that's now been uh, beautified the last few years, um, with a whale skeleton here, where I did uh, a postdoc, um, trying to use the methods uh, of network modeling to study the evolution of gene networks. Um, so this got me to what was my original sort of drive to get into biology to study the evolution of complex regulatory systems. Um, and to my big surprise, after two and a half years of that, I got an offer um, to open up my own lab uh, in Barcelona and Catalonia in Spain, uh, right at the sea. This is the, the building we were working in. Uh, at the Center for Genomic Regulation, and I had a, a research, an empirical research group there for um, seven years um, that basically continued this work of looking at the evolution of gene regulatory networks um, with both experimental and sort of modeling approaches. Then came another life-defining change. So these are really important here um, because I, I got the opportunity to spend a year in Berlin at the Institute for Advanced Study, um, or Wissenschaftskolleg in German, uh, where I got exposed to all kinds of different uh, views on, on the sort of topics that I was um, uh, looking at. So from, from people, artists, and people from completely different fields, philosophers. I also uh, got uh, a job offer during that year to change my career completely. And so I moved uh, uh, to the vicinity of Vienna to Kloster Neuburg, where I'm sitting right now recording this, um, where I was the director, the scientific director of the Conrad Lawrence Institute for um, Cognition and Evolution Research uh, for two years. 
And my aim there was to bring together two different perspectives again, that of the philosophy of biology with theoretical biology. So basically, um, instead of mathematical biology, I, I moved into an area um, that was more philosophical. Mm. Theory doesn't have to be mathematical. This is another big topic during this course. Unfortunately, um, I had uh, my differences with the uh, board and the president of the institute. I didn't share their vision, so I left and have since then been leading a nomadic life as a freelance academic. I've been continuing my uh, collaborations with philosophers um, in different beautiful places. One is uh, the Complexity Science Hub um, in Vienna. Um, I spent uh, some time in Dresden at the Center for Systems Biology, and in Paris at a place called the Center for Interdisciplinary Research, where I started to get really interested in the uh, activism and movement towards a more open and less competitive academia and science, which is a very interesting and important topic to me. And you can talk to me about this if you're interested. So at the same time, I started giving workshops uh, as a freelancer in philosophy of science for scientists and also uh, on creativity based on a philosophical model of the innovation process, which brought me back um, to uh, Vienna where I'm teaching this class and where I'm working with people at the Institute um, for Philosophy on issues of open science innovation and uh, the sort of explanations we use in biology. So I do all of this with the common topic of being interested uh, in how we explain phenomena in biology. And this whole course will be coming from that sort of point of view um, to reflect how, what is an explanation? Why do we use certain explanations over others? Why do you use certain experimental strategies? And can we say something by comparing different perspectives on life? Can we learn something more about what life really is? Okay. And the last thing I've done is I spent, I was supposed to spend two months, but I only spent a bit less than a month, uh, the last few weeks actually, in this wonderful place in Stellenbosch in South Africa, where I, was, uh, where I started to write uh, a book about this course uh, on the philosophy of science for scientists. But this is not going to be the topic here. I had to return um, rather precipitously and, and quick uh, because of the coronavirus situation. And so I've been uh, back here in Klosterneuburg for the last three or four weeks uh, preparing these online lectures. So you can see that um, maybe two things uh, out of this super short biography. One is uh, my sort of path has been a path of exploration. I had no idea that I would be where I am right now. And so I think this is something that academia uh, is supposed to do. It's supposed to allow us to explore um, completely new directions and follow those directions when they come up. Uh, these, these sort of directions are unpredictable. You cannot and should not plan your research career completely in, in advance because this, these unexpected turns, the unpredictability of, of your own future is one of the main things that will be driving your research career. Um, but enough about me. Um, this was just uh, as a quick introduction, the actual topic um, of, of this uh, lecture is the following. It tries to sort of refocus us on the fact that we live in an incredibly rich and complex world. And I'm gonna use throughout the course, this metaphor of the jungle, of rich and thriving uh, jungle. It's, it's lush, it's, everything is changing all the time. Uh, and it's a big mess. Uh, it's very hard to understand this place. So we live in this sort of jungle. Um, that is our world. Um, and this is amazingly, uh, it's amazingly beautiful, whoops, uh, and mysterious, okay? So it's amazing um, how much there is we don't understand. And a lot of people are afraid of this fact, but I, I am fascinated. Uh, and I'm teaching um, the sort of philosophy of the unknown in my courses that deal with creativity and innovation. So one main theme will be here, 
that we have to focus on questions rather than facts. So this course will not necessarily teach you a sort of a set of uh, uh, specific facts, but it will hopefully make you um, uh, wonder and ask questions about the way you do research, the kind of questions, uh, think about the kind of questions that you can ask and um, reflect, make you reflect on what other people maybe think and why it's good to have different perspectives on, on uh, perspectives in such a complex uh, reality. It is hard to understand. It's unpredictable, okay? Things always happen, not just in my career, but everywhere that you cannot possibly predict. Um, this uh, current coronavirus outbreak was not one of these things, okay? It was very predictable. But other events in your private life and in society in general, the financial crash of 2007, were hard to predict and people missed them. The emergence of the internet and so on and so forth, okay? So um, the future is open, the future is predict unpredictable, and this is because the world we live in, we haven't even started um, to understand it properly. But what has happened over the last few hundred years is something called modernity, okay? It's the, you know, first the scientific revolution, the enlightenment, and so on and so forth, um, our extremely um, technologized society today has started to replace uh, this, this sort of mystical admiration of nature that we had before with a completely different view. And it replaced the complexity of the reality okay, with a sort of a fake and oversimplified simulacrum. Okay? Now, what a simulacrum is, is a sort of a, a sketchy representation of the real thing. Okay? Maybe a cheap imitation. Um, and it, it doesn't really do the real thing uh, justice. It's like the simulacrum of a famous statue is, is, is a bad fake, okay? It's easy to see that it's not real. And this is what our view of the world is today. So modernity has un, uh, replaced the, the actual complexity of the real world with uh, a very simple view that aims at understanding completely and controlling the world. So we want to understand the world to manipulate it. We only feel at home in our world if we have it figured out. I am like that. If I move to a new place, which I've done many times in my life, I have to figure out the place. I have to go sniffing around in all corners until I know my surroundings and then I feel at home. Okay? And this is natural. This is what we've done. But sometimes we forget that we've done this. Okay? So the, the view of the world that the scientific revolution has given us um, is based on metaphors. And our main metaphor, and this is important, uh, is that of a machine, okay? This started with Rene Descartes, we'll talk about it a little more during the, the course, but basically this idea that the entire universe is a mechanism, a sort of a clockwork comes up uh, during that early modern time, mm. about 400 years ago, and has been taking the Western world um, and then the rest of the world, um, like a revolution. And so this is a metaphor. This is very important. We're, we're going to talk a lot about metaphors. My, metaphors are important to gain new knowledge. They're tools to, to understand stuff that you don't even have words for. But at the same time, they are not the real thing. They are a simulacrum of the real world, okay? Um, we even treat ourselves nowadays uh, as machines, as clocks. You know, you, you, you optimize your time. You go to the gym. It's terrible. I hate the gym, okay? You, you, uh, you don't want to waste any time. It's like, what, what, what does that mean, wasting your time, you know? Um, the things that I thought uh, were important at any stage in my life turned out to be not the things that really matter at the end. It's really hard um, to optimize yourself. And we, we put ourselves under a lot of pressure. I think we're not entirely happy, although we have it better than, than humanity ha has it ever, had it ever before. Um, we have lost the ability to just enjoy the mystery and the awesomeness of being alive uh, in this amazingly incomprehensible world. 
Here's a little book, by the way, by Julien Frère de la Maitrie, which is called L'Homme Machine. And he says, and this will also haunt us again later on during the course, that organisms are quite easy to figure out. Uh, they're basically just clocks that wind themselves, which is true. But as you may have noticed, there is a lot going into this self-winding aspect of the clock. And we still have absolutely no idea how organisms actually do that. We'll talk more about that later, but basically we don't only treat ourselves, but all other living beings as machines. And that's a problem. It has led to atrocious industrial farming, um, a, a lack of respect for the living and all kinds of other problems. Uh, but even worse than that, um, we treat our social systems, our economy as a machine that we can manipulate. Um, you know, fiscal and, and monetary policy, we're, we're trying to um, control busts and booms and recessions and then something comes along, a little virus and everything goes haywire. Why is that? That is because we have mistaken this system, this complex system, of our society and our economy for a machine where we can pull a few levers and control its performance. This is completely impossible, okay? This is sort of one of the messages, take home messages of this entire course. So the worst thing that we do is that we treat the ecosystems on which we helplessly depend as machines, okay? We exploit them, we use them, okay? We release genetically modified crops into nature without having a clue how they work and how they spread. Ecosystems are absolutely massively beyond our comprehension comprehension. So we should use a sort of a, a cautionary principle here. If we don't understand something, we do something that is potentially really, really harmful, we should not do it. So th this sort of view of, of the universe as a machine, as a clockwork, influences a lot of the crisis we have produced in the last uh, few hundred years. So it, it is exactly because we, we consider our world uh, as manipulable, um, in our control. It leads to a certain hubris. We overestimate our capabilities and we screw up and we create crises. Um, come back to that in a minute. So we helplessly de de depend on, on these really complex ecosystems that we're destroying and we are only now slowly finding out what it means um, that uh, we're destroying them. We have no way of replacing such uh, what people with economists call natural services. Um, if you're worried about viruses and climate change, you should be worried about the massive decline uh, of insect species all over Europe and the rest of the world. Um, pollinators, um, all kinds of problems. We have no idea how this, this whole complexity works together. And the effects that we're causing uh, are systemic. Everything is connected. It's not like a machine where we can replace parts and manipulate parts and optimize the performance at all. So part of this whole uh, uh, movement of modernity, this metaphor of the machine is that we build oversimplified models of our world. Okay, the, the best example, and it's always nice to bash on economists, of course, the dismal science it's called, is rational choice theory, which is uh, for decades has been the, the, the mainstream in economics. And it's, it's simply, these are theories that are based on the assumption that human beings act in a rational way, okay? They make rational choices that optimize, again, optimize, they, they, they perform like machines, you know? They optimize uh, possible outcomes. There's two problems with that. First, humans obviously aren't rational beings uh, or not entirely so. And also often we don't have the information that we would need to optimize uh, a potential outcome. So what we're doing is we, we do this, we're, we're decision-making with uh, insufficient knowledge. And that's what we do in science. We don't like it, but that's what we do. We don't have a clue what's going on. We've made a lot of progress over the last 300 years and science is a great thing, but we should never underestimate the amount of stuff we don't understand. So rational choice theory. Um, genetics, developmental and evolutionary genetics is another oversimplified model of the world. Okay, so the idea that the genome um, contains all the information um, to determine your behavior, your phenotype, is a complete joke. There is no evidence for it. There has never been 
And uh, it's massively oversimplified, as we will see uh, in the course of this lecture, and completely wrong. So why, why do we stick to such models like rational choice theory and uh, genetic determinism, genetic reductionism? Why do we stick to them? And, and the reason is maybe twofold. Um, these models are powerful tools for manipulation. That's one reason, okay? So genetics works for all kinds of things. We have the revolution of CRISPR-Cas9 all over the news. We can edit genomes now. We have tools, again, just like with releasing GMOs into the uh, environment, we have no idea what we're doing, okay? Even with these specific sort of uh, manipulations, the effects of those manipulations, uh, large scale, are completely unpredictable and unknown to us. So lots of ethical problems there. Um, but very effective rational choice uh, models allow economists to, to um, suggest policies that politicians implement and um, they often seem to work, although sometimes they don't and we don't know when they don't. That's one of the problems with this whole view. Um, because if we mistake these models for the real world, we start to believe that you know, genes determine us. Um, we start to believe in those economic models as a sort of a real a representation, an accurate representation of our world. That's when the problem starts. They're not a good representation of the real world. We are mistaking the map for the territory here, and that has dangerous consequences, okay? They create a dangerous illusion of knowledge and control. We think we know more than we actually do, and we start to lack the necessary humility and precaution that we should show uh, when we face a crisis, which is beautifully shown right now during this virus, virus, coronavirus crisis, uh, when people are saying, oh, we should not stay home, it's not going to be that bad. The risk that we, we, we run by not staying home is so much larger than the risk that we run if, if we stay home, that there should be absolutely no question despite the economic damage um, of, of what we should do. And so this, again, uh, has something to do uh, with decision-making uh, in systems, in, in situations where we have absolutely not insufficient, we have absolutely insufficient knowledge. Um, and if we think we know what's going on and we can control the situation, we're fooling ourselves. Foolishness is gonna be um, a big topic in this lecture in general. So this is uh, the map uh, behind me here, uh, a little detail out of this map. My kids are teenagers now, but a few years back when they were smaller, they, they drew this massive map of a world um, where their stuffy, uh, stuffies live, their stuffed animals. And uh, it's a typical example of, of such an oversimplified vision of the world. In this world, nothing bad ever happens. Everything is ordered. Everything is clearly defined. Nothing unexpected happen, happens. It's a safe, a safe place, okay? And somehow humanity has never grown up. My boys have now grown out of this space. Uh, they're facing the real world bravely, but, but parts of humanity and a large part in every one of us is refusing to sort of grow up from, from this fantasy world that we've created. But the problem, of course, is that the world we have built around us, the view of the world, uh, is simple, but it's also extremely fragile. And this not only happens in science, by the way, this is, these are political views that we have are absolutely completely inadequate. Um, uh, and we see this. Um, this, by the way, is a piece of art that's called Heap of Rubble by Christopher Zeman. And so what's happening is those uh, illusions that we've created over the last few hundred years are breaking down all around us at the moment. Um, which leads to a bunch of sort of cascading and really pervasive crises that we're suffering right now. So on one hand, obviously there's an ecological crisis. I've already uh, uh, hinted at that a little bit. There's a socioeconomic crisis. That's also a political crisis, the rise of populism. Our economy is crashing now just because we don't buy stuff we don't need. Um, this is crazy. I mean, we've built a system around those models that we have of the economy. We've built an economy is optimized for efficiency, but it's way too fragile to, to, to sort of uh, survive in the real world uh, uh, of unpredictability and complexity. And on top of that, obviously, because our models of the world are failing, 
um, we have created uh, what you could call, and John Brovecki has called, a, a meaning crisis. We have lost our bearings, have lost our meaning uh, in this world. Mm. And that's because our old views are breaking down. Okay, there's a great YouTube channel by John Rebecca, which is called Awakening from the Meaning, um, not for the meaning crisis, but from the meaning crisis, sorry for that, um, that you should check out if you're interested. Um, I'll post these videos on YouTube and we'll provide links um, to the sources I cite uh, below the video. So another thing that happens because of this breakdown is that, um, here is a, a wonderful quote from uh, the best-selling philosophy book of all times, Harry Frank, for um, his essay on bullshit. It's very short. You can read it in two hours. I highly recommend it. It's an actual philosophical series of philosophical treaties. And he is um, saying that one of the most salient features of our culture right now is that there is so much bullshit. We'll talk about bullshit, especially in science, in a bit. So instead of facing the complexity uh, of the world, changing, facing our uncertainty about uncertainty and really be, being serious about having to change our ways, that we have no control, that there is no predictability. What we're doing is we're retreating more and more uh, into a world that is completely removed from the real world. And that's the world of bullshit. There's a short video linked below on YouTube that summarizes Frankfurt's work beautifully as well and features an interview. Um, with him. So another source on bullshit is the forthcoming uh, book by Carl Bergstrom and Jevin West calling bullshit, which is um, specifically about data-driven bullshit um, that you've surely encountered during your studies already. Um, I highly recommend following Carl uh, on Twitter and checking out his website, um, callingbullshit.org. Uh, the book is not yet out uh, but will be in a few months. So these are problems. We are deluded. We are deluding ourselves and we are refusing. A lot of us are refusing to exit the delusion. Okay. We are pretending that the world we live in, the world we've created is still adequate and represents the complexity of the real world. But so why, why do we desperately stick to this simple illusion? Okay. Um, one reason, I think, is that we see no alternative. There is no way out. What else is there except to, to, to you know, be open to this frightening, horrendous uncertainty the world gives us, unpredictability, to be hopelessly um, at, you know, the, the, you're not in control, okay? So this is, this is really hard for us, deep down, to, to admit. And we have to find a more participative mode of interacting with the world than that of manipulation and control. This is something my old uh, teacher, uh, uh, unfortunately deceased, uh, Brian Goodwin, he was always stressing back when I was uh, studying for my master's in 1999. We have to switch from control to participation. We cannot anticipate, we can only um, build systems, we can judge when to be careful and when not, but we cannot anticipate exactly what's going to happen next. So another source that I highly recommend is a, is a very sort of funny movie. Uh, it's a documentary that, that could, you know, would profit from a bit of uh, fact checking here and there, but its general message is, is, is really clear. It's, it's called Hypernormalization by famous documentary maker Adam Curtis. Um, and it's, uh, it's exactly about um, this situation. Hypernormalization uh, uh, is a, a term coined by a Soviet anthropologist at the end of the Soviet era, where uh, he realized that nothing was as it was um, supposed to be, but nobody, uh, nobody would believe or buy into the propaganda, but nobody saw a way out. And this is where we are, this is the message of the movie, uh, at the moment uh, in our, uh, what you could call a late um, free market capitalist, consumer capitalist society. So we know our model of, models of living, of understanding the world are breaking down, but we can't get out. And so we live in this situation, hyper-normalization, 
we don't see the world as it is, but as we see our models as more real than the real world, which is a real problem. You can watch this movie for free on YouTube. It's quite long though. Um, so we all have a choice, okay? We don't have to play along. It's up to you to make that choice. Here is Morpheus giving you the red pill or the blue pill. You really should read Jean Baudrillard's Simulacra and Simulation, which is the philosophy book that inspired the Matrix. Um, so what's happening here, okay? We are refusing to take the red pill, but we need the red pill. Philosopher Charles Taylor wrote a book called The Secular Age, and he writes about the disappearance of the religious worldview, and he said, he calls this modernity as the great disembedded. So we were embedding, embedded before in a mysterious sort of uh, world, and, and it was full of mysticism. But on the other hand, it wasn't pretending that we understood what was going on. Um, so what we need uh, is a great re-embedding at the time. We need to, at, at this time, we need to sort of see the reality for what it is again. And there is no mysticism required. You don't have to be religious to do this. We, as we shall see during this lecture, can do it by just looking a bit more uh, with a different sort of set of eyes uh, than what we usually do. So we can take that red pill, and I hope um, you're going to follow me taking the red pill um, into this course during this semester. Another series of books that I highly recommend is Nassim uh, Nicholas Taleb's uh, Incerto series, especially start maybe with Anti-Fragile or the Black Swan. Um, and these books talk exactly about the fragility of the systems uh, and the models of the world that we have right now. And what we want is anti-fragility. This is not resilience or robustness, which merely survives unpre unpredictable shocks, but it's like your immune system, something that can improve and learn from such shocks. This is the kind of society we should build. And actually, uh, anti-fragility is extremely important for biology because the systems that we know of that are anti-fragile, those systems are mostly organic, unplanned, self-organizing, um, living systems or systems in which living beings uh, cooperate in specific ways. So we're going to have a look at that during this course as well. So we're going away from the machine metaphor. Machines are never never anti-fragile, they're always fragile. They break down all the time, they need maintenance. We don't want to look at our, our economy, our ecosystems, at organisms like they are machines. They are not because they are not fragile, like the mechanisms and the machines humanity has built. Um, you can take this even further. So Taleb um, likes the German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche very much. And he has an absolutely brilliant and extremely short passage in his book, The Twilight of the Idols, that is called The History of an Error. And it tells the story of how the real world, that is the fake world, the ideal world that we've actually built around us, uh, finally became a, a fable. Nietzsche talks about religion, but we can use it and extend it into modernity. It takes uh, five or six steps. The first step uh, happens with Plato. Um, who uh, comes up with the, the, the allegory of the cave. We'll talk about this as well in the course. And, and he says, the real world, the one you live in, that you experience isn't real, okay? That's just shadows on the wall. And uh, to see the real world, the, the, which was for Plato, the, the world of ideal forms, you have to be wise. Later on, uh, the church said you have to be pious or virtuous uh, to see reality as it is. As a second step in history, the real world with Christianity became unattainable for anyone for now, but it's promised if you're wise, pious, and virtuous during your life, you will go to heaven. So everybody was neglecting real life, the real world for something ideal that they thought was more real. The third step is the real world uh, becomes unattainable, unprovable, unpromisable. You can't promise anywhere, uh, anyone to get there. But the mere thought of it helps us to get by, consoles us, and uh, obliges us uh, to be good people, okay? 
which uh, uh, ends up in Kant's um, categorical imperative. Um, and so this is the world an sich, as Kant calls it, okay? But we cannot sense it. We never see it. We never experience it. It's transcendental. It's beyond um, uh, what is important in our everyday lives. But it goes further. The positivists come along. We'll talk about those for sure in the coming lectures. They say the real world is not important because you can't attain it. It's unknown. We don't know what it's about. Um, it doesn't give us any consolation, no redemption, no obligation. And what we cannot measure, what we cannot experience doesn't even exist. Okay. So this idea is of no further use and all free spirits, this is Nietzsche's own view, of course, let's do away with this ideal world. But it went on and on and on. Um, 150 years later, we still live not in a religious uh, imaginary real world, you know, this idealized real world. Uh, but we still have it today, and it's our scientific worldview at the moment, a mechanistic view of the world. But the problem is, so now that we have done away with this, with this ideal world, what is left? An apparent world? No. With the real world, we have also done away with the apparent one, the apparent one being um, um, the scientific, the simplified worldview that came with religion. Um, uh, a view of certainty and control, okay, that we have to let go if we want to get out of this current uh, crisis of humanity. We have to embrace the world that we live in, just like the ancients did, but with the information that we have today. So the great oversimplification affects science and especially, of course, uh, biology and the social sciences. In physics, simplification uh, often works if you're not in condensed matter physics or some other uh, complexity, uh, uh, science-related part of it. Um, you could even say physics unfairly picked all the problems that were um, sort of amenable to simplification right at the beginning of the scientific revolution and left us biologists with all the rest. And the approaches of physics, like reductionism, they just don't work in biology. This the central topic of this course. So today, of course, we no longer use clocks as machine metaphors, but the uh, cells and organisms have become computers. Important again to note that all of this is purely, purely metaphorical, okay? There is no um, reality to it um, in any sort of um, uh, sensible uh, interpretation of that term. So, we think that there are molecular machines in cells that run genetic programs. We'll talk about um, this metaphor of a genetic program a lot. Genetic, pro genetic programs don't exist and they are no longer useful as a metaphor today, except for very limited cases, for very specialized research. Organisms become optimized through evolution by natural selection, also not true. Um, that's all just a bunch of metaphors. That's not real science, okay? And they're not very good. They're failing us right now. We need better metaphors. We need better concepts. And we don't have them yet. So one of the problems I'm going to have here is I'm going to criticize a lot, but um, we need to sort of reset the system before we can start developing a new view, um, which I will do towards the end of the course, of course. So we need to move away from this idea that organisms are machines because they are not. They are not fragile. They don't function like machines at all. There's many, many differences. We'll get into those in due time. And they're very uh, uh, essential. But nevertheless, okay, the network, that remains our dominant metaphor in system sciences, okay? And these, the, this metaphor, again, so th this, we use it for living systems, for systems that form part of ecosystems, social systems, our e economy. Anthropologists work with networks. Everything is a network nowadays. And it makes us feel good. We are, we are going beyond reductionism. We don't only look at the single parts. But look at this. This is still a machine. It has parts, connections. You can switch the parts around. Um, living systems. Uh, are not networks. It, 
the network metaphor comes from biology straight from engineering, um, machine engineering, electric, uh, electrical engineering, and of course, uh, mechanistic physics that has been superseded over the last 100 years by, by other theories like quantum physics and relativity, but not in biology. We're still stuck in these mechanical sort of metaphors, engineering metaphors. So the problem is that cells, organisms, ecosystems, societies, and economies, they are not networks, okay? And that's what I will try to convince you of. If you follow me into this course, we will explore um, organisms, living systems, and their evolution beyond this metaphor of the network. I've worked on networks for a long time in my career, and I think they're an extremely useful tool, again, to model certain aspects of biological systems and their evolution. But they are not, organisms are not networks. They are not machines. We want to look at what organisms really are and how evolution really works and how little we understand about that. So please join me in this exploration. Uh, in the following, it's going to happen in the following sort of 14 modules. What I'm going to do this year is I'm, I'm going to record, this is a long lecture now, but for all of the other modules, I'm going to record short lectures, hopefully 15, 20 minutes long, about um, aspects of these 14 uh, different um, uh, topics here. Well, one is the introduction, I should say, 13 different topics. The introduction includes this video plus a little video about the purpose of my teaching, which I will also upload shortly. Um, the following two uh, lectures are uh, laying the philosophical foundations of what we need, and that may appear a little strange. It is a lecture about organisms and evolution, but before we can get to those topics, we need to clarify two philosophical issues, and those are uh, perspectives um, that it is when if you have a different perspective from someone else it doesn't mean you contradict them you can and should have multiple perspectives on complex systems in fact complexity is defined by how many perspectives you can have and they're valid on a specific system the more the more complex the system is okay the second aspect is uh, the aspect of process thinking, everything in evolution and in biology in general is not a thing, but a process. Everything changes all the time. So we need to switch perspectives from object-oriented thinking towards process thinking. As soon as we have those philosophical foundations laid down, we can look at living systems. So we'll start again very philosophically by defining what a system really is and how we represent um, uh, or, or not represent systems by models, how we study them with models. Uh, we will then get into very specific models, nitty gritty uh, network models and, and mechanisms and, and what they do and what they don't do for us, okay? Um, I will then argue that mechanisms are uh, uh, processes, okay? And, and I will show you a way of, of uh, studying those processes using uh, concepts like attractors and bifurcations. We will then switch gears and look at how um, these sort of mechanisms work within more complex systems that are not purely mechanistic, okay? How causality flows in those complex systems. Um, and then we get to the main point of this part of the lecture, uh, uh, um, a little uh, argument on how causality uh, on organisms are not machines, okay? They have agency and how they are the basic units of biology. We will then switch to evolution um, and have a quick philosophical look at what evolution actually is, the metaphysics of evolution. Uh, we will then compare three different um, uh, traditional perspectives on evolution uh, and see how they help us better understand the process. Um, and uh, we will then quickly uh, intermittently talk about a big bullshit debate about evolutionary synthesis. So I will illustrate how bullshit has invaded um, uh, science, not just the rest of society. Um, and uh, I will then finish uh, that part by, by telling you what 
network evolution actually does. So we, we start with some concepts like modules, robustness, and evolvability. Um, but we'll then move into the orange and the red part of the lecture, which goes into new territory. And we'll introduce uh, a new notion of modularity and homology as a, a sort of a foundation for a novel um, kind of Evo Devo. And uh, we'll then uh, go uh, to sort of a central theme of a process oriented biology, and that is the dynamic emergent co origination of pretty much everything in the living domain. As I said, you will uh, be able to download those lectures from Moodle um, and watch them. Please watch them at your leisure on your own um, if you have registered for this course. Um, we will then meet twice a week as indicated uh, in the uh, USPACE system um, to discuss those lectures. We, I will not repeat those lectures, but we will uh, uh, do question and answers. It's probably not going to take one and a half hours each, but that's the time slot we have. Please join us. It's not um, mandatory to do so. Nothing is in the master's course, but uh, it will be useful. Um, these discussions will be moderated and I will introduce the sort of etiquette and the technology of that. You will get a, a, a link to a Zoom meeting by email and you can also find the times and the schedule of that on Uspace. For everybody else who's watching this on YouTube, um, thank you for watching uh, this without having to. Uh, and uh, I will post the future lectures here in this channel um, on this playlist. Uh, if you have questions, just enter them below or contact me uh, on Twitter. I'm doing this uh, for free, so give me time. Um, I am a slow person. I hate being hurried, um, but I will eventually get back to you. Okay, this is the first uh, part of the lectures. If you have suggestions, comments, uh, you contact me uh, at these different uh, places here. Um, and the next um, little lecture is just going to introduce my sort of general teaching philosophy. It's going to be a bit less long than this one. Thank you very much for watching this and listening to me. See you back soon.